Thanks, um, thanks, Jono. And um, well, hi, guys. Um, nice to meet you. Um, so, so the, the way I come to this conversation, I, uh, I studied science um, over 30 years ago now, um, and I worked in research for a few years, then worked in what we call extension, which is about trying to help growers use agricultural research. Um, then spent, spent some time helping companies use research, um, use innovation to develop new products and new markets. Then I was fortunate enough to get a job at the University of Queensland in, in their commercialization company called UniQuest, um, where I spent 10 years commercializing food and ag research. Um, and during that time, I started four different startup companies. Um, one of them was ProGel and another one was Perky. Um, so, uh, so ProGel is a company that I, I, I helped found. Um, I actually started that company, I raised the capital and um, and am still CEO of ProGel. So ProGel is a company I still run. Um, I run that on a, on a daily basis. Perky is a business that I started out of ProGel. So Perky uses the ProGel technology to, um, to, to basically encapsulate probiotics and develop uh, probiotic drinks. So you can find Perky, you can see the image of the products there. You can find them in Coles and Woolworths nationally, um, both in the steel and the sparkling version. Um, and so that's, I guess, and then about five and a half years ago, the University of Queensland Business School asked me um, to come on and teach entrepreneurship um, at a really practical level. So the course I teach, the course that, that Thomas is taking, um, is a very practical course. So I teach into the MBA. I teach the entrepreneurship capstone in the MBA, which is the last course that you do in the MBA. And I also teach the Lean Startup course in the um, Entrepreneurship and Innovation Masters. And, and I guess I don't teach per se as, as a teacher, I teach as a practitioner and, and in some senses I'm a, I'm a mentor of people on this journey. So, um, so, so what I want to do is I'm going to give you a few things that I've learned over the last 30 years about innovation, about being an inventor, about being a researcher, about being someone who helps people use it and actually by actually creating innovations and taking them to the market myself. You know, and why I think this is really important is because what's happened with, the, um, with, with COVID and the, and the pandemic is that what we, we are in what the World Economic Forum calls the Great Reset. We have this opportunity where, where whole industries have been affected. Every industry has been disrupted. Every community has been disrupted. Um, and, and what um, Klaus Schwab says from the World Economic Forum is that this is a rare but narrow window of opportunity to reflect, reimagine and reset our world. You know, and I think, um, I think entrepreneurship or innovation gives us that opportunity to actually you know, reimagine and reset our world or parts of our world. Um, that's why I think this is really important. You know, and, and there's some really big problems. The reason why this is important is there's some really big problems to solve. You know, we've got an extra 2 billion people we need to feed. We need to do so um, with less water and by emitting less carbon. Um, and while at the same time dealing with climate change um, with, with profound effects on our environment. We also have these quite transformational technologies, automation, um, machine learning, artificial intelligence, uh, robotics, all of these technologies, which are, which in some cases actually making um, jobs redundant in some sectors, um, but also creating the opportunities. And the bottom right hand corner, which, which Thomas is familiar with, um, is a picture of spent grain. So that's, that's the barley that's gone into beer making manufacturing processes. And this product is a waste product. And I, I show this particular image because it's an example of what innovation can do. Because what that particular ingredient does this is basically, um, you take barley, you turn it into, into um, sugar, you ferment the sugar into alcohol and then into, make it into beer, which we give to humans and it makes them angry and, and overweight. Um, but what that particular ingredient is, is it's the most nutritious pound for pound ingredient, you know, you know, in the food industry, but it's basically berry or given to cows. And I think why, why I use that example is because there's, there's a whole bunch of companies all around the world that are trying to work out how do we take the 200 thousand um, tons of this product we have in this country um, to actually convert it into something that could actually lower cholesterol and, and lower blood lipids in humans and actually prevent diabetes. And so that's what innovation does. It helps you to see a problem. It helps you to exploit an opportunity to benefit someone or to, to, to solve a problem. Um, and, and I guess my, my field is in entrepreneurship and, and I guess it's important to start is why do most startups fail? 95% you know, of startups fail. I think something like between 80 and 90% of products fail. And so a lot of companies have innovation management systems and they have a process that's designed to manage their innovation, but profoundly, the vast, vast majority, certainly more than 80% of big companies and more than 95% in terms of startups, they fail. And so there's something wrong with those innovation systems. There's something that there's some element of problem they're not solving. 
And what this tells us here is that the main reasons products fail or businesses fail is because there's no market need. And that's, that's, that's a, an unforgivable problem to solve um, because if you're launching something that no one wants, that's just stupid. And, and it's actually worse than stupid because what it means is you're not doing something that they do need. Okay, so there's this, there's this sort of opportunity cost. And that's why we in the, in the innovation field are so passionate about trying to get this system working better is so we can actually solve problems that people really need, actually, actually solve problems that are really needed to be solved. You know, and so what I've learned, I guess, is that innovation failure comes from the inability to deliver a unique solution to an unresolved problem, faster, cheaper, or better than status quo. And those orange words are really important. So to be innovation, there needs to be some form of uniqueness to the solution. But fundamentally, you need to apply that solution to an unresolved problem. Um, and you need to do it faster, better, or cheaper than status quo. You know, one of the best examples of this is, um, is uh, oh gosh, I forgot the company's name. One of the big tech companies launched the Iridium satellite phone, maybe 10 or 15, nearly 20 years ago now. Um, um, one of the big Asian companies. And they spent literally billions of dollars putting satellites all around the world. And they launched the Iridium satellite phone and it just totally failed. It was a very unique solution. But you know what most people realize is most people don't need a satellite phone. The only people that need a satellite phone are, are people that are a long distance from a capital city, you know, people that are in, a, in the desert. And the market was just not there. So they had actually had a unique solution, but it, they did not address an unresolved problem. Or if they did, that unresolved problem wasn't big enough to sustain a multi-billion dollar industry. And so thinking about what is the problem and making sure you're solving an unresolved problem, not an already resolved problem, and you're doing it better than it's currently being solved. Just because you create a little bit faster or a little, just a little bit nicer or a little bit cheaper, that's probably not gonna be enough. You need to be a lot better, a lot faster, a lot cheaper, or a lot better than the status quo. You know, um, uh, Ralph Emerson in the 1800s said this statement, which is, which is interesting, and, and there's, some, there's some truth to it, but there's also a sting in the tail. If you build a better mousetrap, the world will be the path to your door. Now, now that was somewhat true, um, um, but what's happened is we've had now four and a half thousand mousetrap patents issued since 1828, since, since Ralphie um, said this thing. Um, in fact, it's, it, you know, people say it's one of the most frequently invented devices in US history, but very few of them have ever made any money, except for this one. So in 1894, um, Mr. or well, Mrs. Hooker came up with an animal trap. 1894, um, and the thing I love about this is so what Emerson said is right. Um, if you build a better mousetrap, the world will be the path to your door. People are still building a path to this door. This is probably one of the only inventions that is 130 years old. You know, think of it, 1894, you can still go to Bunnings and buy this thing. You can still buy it. It's still solving the problem. So you could say that the mouse problem is still not, it is actually, was actually resolved in 1894. So all these new mousetrap patterns, most of them aren't able to do it much better than this. The, the mousetrap problem was solved in 1894, or maybe even earlier if you think of cats. And, and so what we know, and, and this is a, a, a key insight with, that I got from the CEO and the founder of, uh, the ex-CEO and founder of, of Y Combinator, probably one of the most successful startup incubators in the world in Silicon Valley. And he said that the common denominator to all of the companies that were successful, and these are some of the very big tech companies that you'd be very familiar with, is that the ones that were successful were all mission driven. They're all driven by solving a really compelling problem that really needed to be solved. Um, and the ones that had the most success and the most, the most accelerated speed were ones that were mission driven. And so again, mission gives you this idea of what problem you're solving. Eric Ries in his book, The Lean Startup says, you know, the question is not, can this product be built, but should it? And can we build a sustainable business? So the goal of innovation is not, can we do this? And, and we've got all these innovation projects we're managing, but should we be managing these projects? It's actually more of a should we question than a can we question. Because if you throw enough money at a problem, you'll create a solution. But if it's not unresolved, or if you're not able to do it profoundly better than status quo, it's not, it's not gonna succeed. So the summary here is just because you can, doesn't mean you should. You know, and, and I say this to researchers all the time because researchers are primarily focused on doing research, discovering new knowledge, and putting that knowledge out into, the, into their, the public domain. But they profoundly fail 90, probably 99% of the time because just because you can doesn't mean you should. They're creating solutions that no one wants. You could say, um, 
you know, perhaps, in a perhaps more famous quote from Jurassic Park, you know, sometimes scientists were so preoccupied with whether or not they could, they didn't stop to think if they should. They're very telling from a Jurassic Park sort of theme plot. Um, why I love Simon Sinek from Start With Why is any he's talking about humans as well as corporates. But what he's saying is primarily we need to start with why rather than starting with the how or what most people do is they start with the what. This is what I do. But why is a much more compelling? Why is your mission is your mission driven? So if you're trying to change the world, if you're trying to change your life, if you're trying to change you know, the, the, the part of the business that you're in, you've got to have a mission. You've got to understand why you're doing this. Not just saying, here's a new widget, go and try and sell it. Unless you understand why that widget is going to work, unless you understand what is the problem, what is the, 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 the key problem we're trying to solve with this widget or with this service or with this app, then the likelihood of you being successful is pretty limited. And, and to understand your why, you've really got to understand your who. You've really got to understand the humans that you're trying to interact with and try and work out because a why is always connected to a who. You know, and primarily a lot of people talk about entrepreneurship, it's about getting rich, making a lot of money. That's, that's exactly the wrong way to think about entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurship is about solving really big, compelling problems. And if you're really good at that and you have a really innovative solution and you find a business model that's sustainable and scalable, you might make some money out of that. But if that's your primary, primary driver, even if you're successful, I tell you, you'll be disappointed. Solving problems for people is what we humans do. It's what we humans do best. And so this gets found in this, this, this why, how, what, and who gets found somewhere in the melee between understanding a problem and creating a solution. Um, and so the job of an innovator is to solve problems people care about. You know, there's some debate as to whether Einstein actually said this, but it sounds cool if he did. If I had an hour to solve a problem, I'd spend 55 minutes on the problem and five minutes on the solution. You know, and ironically, that's the opposite of what most innovators and entrepreneurs do. They spend most of their time thinking about the solution. And then at the end of the process, they think, okay, now who's the customer? And that's why they fail time and time again. So the, the stages that we talk about when I'm, when I'm consulting on this, when I'm working with big corporates or researchers to take an idea and move it into the marketplace to have impact is you've got to have proof there's a problem, proof that my solution solved this problem, proof I can build a business around my solution and then proof I can repeat this at scale. If you skip any of that stages, any of those stages, the chances are you'll fail. If you go, you've got an idea and then you scale. I read a post on LinkedIn just last week I'm from an Australian company that has failed twice now in launching this, this new particular range of sausage products. It's a meat company. That, and, and he was quite honest in his post on LinkedIn. He said, you know, we failed again. We launched with wool with coals six months ago and it failed. So we changed the packaging, we changed the flavors and we launched again and we failed again. You know, so, so the idea is not just launching at scale. It's actually trying to work out, is this problem? Do I understand what the problem is? And does this solution solve that problem? Is there a business model that's sustainable? And can I do this at scale? And big companies fail because they just launch at scale. They have an idea, they create a product and they just launch at scale. So primarily the, the, the job of an entrepreneur or an, or an innovator is to get uh, a, an opportunity which is both desirable or, or, or together, desirable, viable and feasible. But you've got to start with desirable. Desirable is understanding the why, understanding the who, understanding the problem. Before you think about, you know, how much money can I make out of this? Or, you know, can we actually do it? The can we is feasible. The should we is desirable. Um, so the can we is, is viable and feasible. The should we is desirable. And that's where we need to start as innovators. And we go through this process through, you know, what, what many of us call the double diamond, um, where we're in terms of the problem, we need to be divergent. We need to be thinking really broadly about the problem. Because if you think you know the problem, I can almost guarantee you, unless you've talked to hundreds and hundreds of customers that have that problem, you're probably wrong. And so we need to be divergent about really open-minded and empathetic around that problem. And then we converge around, okay, now I think I understand the problem. Now I'm going to go through the same process around the solution. And in the class that I've got um, that Thomas is in, you know, I'm challenging people all the time. They're saying, here's my solution and, and this is the problem. I'm saying, well, how well do you know the problem? Because if you don't know the problem with great detail, with great empathy, with great sort of pathology, then there's no way you can know if your solution is a good idea. And so it's almost like you've got to park your solution until you really understand, until you've converged you know, on what the problem is. Um, this is another nicer way from IDEO, um, the guys who invented design thinking. Um, diverge, converge, diverge, converge. It's this process that you go through as an innovator. And I think the idea management systems or innovation management systems, they don't account for this, the fact that you, you, you've got to diverge and converge. Because what a lot of innovation management systems is they're just all pushing you down to this sort of narrow thing. 
but you realize as you get new information, you've got to go out again, you go in again and you go out again. That's how innovation really works. So when you're thinking about your why, you've got to understand that consumers are resistant to change. You know, um, humans are resistant to change. So you've got to understand what are the driving forces for change and the restraining forces for status quo. You know, because consumers are primarily motivated to help them achieve their wants, enable their dreams or avoid their fears. Humans will do anything to avoid something they're fearful of. You know, they will do almost anything to help enable their dreams. But if there's a fear and a dream, the fear will always hold them back. And so sometimes you've got to work out, well, what is this person scared of? What do I have to uh, ameliorate? What's the fear that I have to overcome? The, the fear, which is a, a restraining force to able to unlock and exploit and leverage this driving force of a dream or a want. And when we're doing this, when we're doing innovation, we've really got to make sure we focus on the innovators and early adopters. A lot of people say, my market is, is the health, health sector or my market is China or my market is is white middle-class males. Um, you know, again, you've got to be very focused. When you're in innovation, you need to be playing in the innovator early adopter space because that's where the appetite for, for change is actually high. So you want to try and find humans or customers that have really got an appetite for change. They're actually, they're already trying to hack together a solution. And in fact, we call it, if you're thinking about an early adopter, you don't want to just go to someone who has the problem. You don't even want to go to someone who is aware that they have the problem. You don't necessarily even want to talk to someone who's just looking for solutions, who's just scanning and searching for solutions. You want to try and find someone, an early adopter or an innovator, is already hacking together a solution um, and is already spending money trying to solve that problem because they have this, this, this driving force which has already exceeded the restraining forces. Okay, the people that have a problem are doing nothing about it. They, they have almost no driving force. They're just entirely limited by their restraining force. So again, part of the innovation is working almost down this from the top to the bottom at the same time as you're working from left to right. Okay, people who are laggards, they, they may even not know they have a problem or if they do, they don't really care. That is not your customer. If you've got to convince someone that they have a problem, you're stuffed. You have got no chance. You are just dead before you get out of the box. So again, my question to you as an innovator and any innovation management program should be what problem are you or what problem are we solving and who cares? Fundamentally, that's got to be the question you ask. Um, Tim Castell, who's an associate professor here, wrote this great paper back in 2014. And he said, to turn an idea into an innovation, you've got to do two things. You've got to make it real, which is, you know, no point having a great idea for perpetual motion if you can't make it real. It's a great idea. It's actually not about that. It's a crap idea because you can't make it real. Making it real is the first part, but the most important part is how does that idea unlock value? And that's actually really hard. If you've got enough time and enough money and you're smart enough, you probably turn your idea into something that could be an invention. But unlocking value is a very, a very abstract sort of process. You've got to work out what problem is this idea going to solve. And ideally, you should be doing that even before you start making it real. Now, when you, if you just do the top bit and you create this innovative solution, you end up with, with what Australia spent $30 million in 10 years creating, which is this Vital Vegetables project, which is this project where they created these carrots and broccoli and tomatoes that had high levels of phytonutrients on the premise that if they created vegetables that were more healthy, that were more healthy for you, um, that consumers would pay a premium. Totally failed. $30, $30 million, 10 years, almost no commercialization out of that project. You compare that with what... Um, this lady here, the, the HR executive who created Collie Power, um, she was just sick and tired of having um, gluten-free pizza bases that just tasted like cardboard and they were high in carbs anyway. And so she took up what was not terribly innovative solution, Vital Vegetables had PhDs coming up the wazoo. She's actually just thought, well, I wonder if I can make a, a, a pizza base that has low carb and is gluten-free. She's created this cauliflower pizza base. And in her first year of sales, she sold $45 million worth of product. The company's now worth half a billion dollars and she's worth over $200 million US. Now, ironically, the, the Vital Vegetables Project, which had you know, hundreds of really smart scientists spending millions of dollars, have had zero effect on increasing vegetable consumption. This person who spent not much money at all has profoundly increased the, the vegetable consumption of cauliflower. I mean, who would have thought you'd get anyone to eat cauliflower? I mean, it's disgusting. It tastes like nothing. But she's now single-handedly increasing vegetable consumption across North America. Um, and made a whole lot of money doing it. So that's what happens. That's the reward of solving a problem that really counts, is that you not only solve the problem, but you get to benefit. Just a comment from the students saying that deep corporate pockets can sometimes you know, cause you to 
overspend. Oh, yeah. that's look such a good such a good comment. Um, and we did a project with CSR, one of the biggest building companies in Australia. Um, and we'd done all this innovation stuff and tried to understand the problem. And they got to this point where they developed this new brick. Um, and there was big problems with brickies. You couldn't get brickies because no one wants to work for the bricky. Um, you know, about this. Um, and, and so they had this idea that, and they had this prototype product and they just decided to launch. Um, we said, well, you haven't validated it yet. You've, you've got an idea of a solution. You've got this idea of a, of a problem and a solution. And so we just, we're just going to launch. So they launched and it just totally failed. Not because the idea was wrong, because they just didn't understand the market. They didn't actually understand that this was a long-term process. Yeah. And so the pressure for them to actually try and get something into the marketplace was so strong that they launched, but then it failed anyway. And so, you know, it's, it's a tragedy. And that's why I said, if you skip any of those stages, if you skip the stage that says, proof that my solution solves this problem, proof that there's a business model, uh, and, and uh, probably the key issue here is the problem is never technical. It's always human. It's always behavioral. And so whether it's trust or whether it's credibility or whether it's cost or whatever it is, um, you've got to understand the problem. Um, I think that's time. Um, uh, 10 30. Okay. So, um, so there's, there's two elements here which, are, which we use in innovation. We use that technology readiness level and most innovation programs will, will rank an innovation based on what it's TRL, from TRL1, which is just a basic idea right through TRL-9, which is a launch product. TRL was developed by NASA after they put man on the moon and they had all these rocket scientists came out of the closet thinking, I've got a great new idea for a new rocket to help the space race. Um, and so they, they developed the TRL to work out how advanced is these, are these different rocket, you know, spaceship ideas, uh, rocket scientist ideas. Um, and so that's used right across the world in terms of understanding how advanced the technology is. But, but in the last 10 years, this investment readiness level um, has been developed, which really goes side and socks alongside the TRL, which says, well, do I have a hypothesis around what problem does this solve? And have I achieved problem solution fit? And once we've achieved problem solution fit, what does product market fit? Because problem solution is not the same as product market. Problem might be, I understand that humans want to, want to um, lose weight. Um, solution might be, I need to give them some cognitive behavior therapy. Okay, it's really generic. The product market fit might be, okay, the market might be tech savvy, 25 to 30 year old females who use Facebook regularly and are very comfortable using apps. Um, they're, they're, they're typically overweight. Um, they might be 20 or 30 kilos overweight. They might have just given birth to their first child. Um, the product is now a cognitive behavior therapy app, which actually they can download or it's, it's a function within Facebook, which is a function within this. It's, it's something that's connected and it's got a video program. So that's so moving from problem solution to product market is really different. Um, and then we need to validate the business model, you know, the right-hand side of the canvas, which is all around desirability, how do we connect with our customers and the left-hand side of the business model canvas, which is all around who do we partner with? Um, and then how do we make sure we know what success looks like? So, so unless you do these two things in parallel, you'll end up making it real on the left-hand side of things um, without actually working out how do you unlock value. And so as an innovation system, you need to make sure you're understanding, you're making it real and unlocking value simultaneously. Because otherwise you get to the TRL9, you've got something ready to launch, but you don't know who your customer is or you don't know what problem to solve. The reason why I'm really passionate about this, you can probably tell, um, is that in this country, we spend over $10 billion a year on research. And I'm, I'm really annoyed about this because because there's there's like maybe a, a one to two to $300 million worth of commercialization revenue that flows from this, which you know is not, it's not about the money, but it's about some form of evidence that this is being translated into value. Um, and I'm sure there's a lot of papers being written and, and that's really great, but we're taking $10 billion and we're turning into two to $300 million. Now, that seems to be going the wrong way. You would think that if you're spending $10 billion on innovation, you'd actually get maybe $100 billion worth of benefit. It just doesn't work that way. And that I think is a really, really big problem. So what I'm really passionate about is how do we unlock ideas from the intellectual faults of universities and research agencies? How do we unlock all of this value all of these things that researchers have already made real and how do we unlock the value and actually take it out into the marketplace? And if we didn't know, I, I said, I just finished a project with the sugar research agency that manages sugar research in Australia. And I said, guys, you don't need to do any more research on how do you grow sugar environmentally friendly. You don't need to do any more research. You've done decades of research. No one's using your research. Let's work out why they're not using it and let's try and take your research and take it into the marketplace and try and work out how can we create products and services that growers can actually use so they can reduce the use of their nitrogen, so they can reduce water use, so they can actually improve their, their productivity, so they can actually have a less impact on the environment. 
um, they can sequester carbon in the soil. Let's actually just work out why they're not doing what you've already done. Um, Rita McGrath from the Columbia Business School said this great thing. And, and this is the thing you've got to be aware of in innovation management systems is that innovation theatre is an excessive focus on ideation and all that goes with that hackathons and all that sort of stuff with little capacity or commitment to follow the process through to actual results. You know, and this is the enemy of, this is, this is what, you know, innovation theatre is a lot of innovation management systems have, is it's just, we've got to be an innovative company. So let's have, let's throw a million dollars or $5 million or $10 million at an innovation program. But ultimately, when you look at it, what's come out of that, if unless you're getting real tangible products and growth, um, it's just innovation theatre. And in fact, um, the um, European Commission said, Europe is very good at transforming euros into knowledge. It's not good at transforming knowledge into euros. Okay, and that's clearly the, the, the enemy of innovation. Okay, and, and, and everyone sucks at it all around the world. And so innovation management systems need to find ways to actually improve that. So again, the process is going from problem to problem solution fit, problem solution fit to product market fit, and product market fit to business model fit. Um, I won't go through that. So let me just tell you a little bit about my journey um, really quickly. So what, what do we do? Um, we create, so ProGel, this is the, the ProGel technology. We create actives, which might be probiotics or immune boosting supplements that you normally find in tablets. And we turn them into, into a formulation that can be put into consumer products, which consumers can enjoy in a very different way. So you can see there, that's a picture of a probiotic microgel. Um, that's an image of, of a, about a 30 to 50 micrometer size, which is about 5% of a millimeter. Um, and that goes into, uh, into probiotic drinks for Perky. And what it does is it's, it's low cost, it's tasteless, we know it's effective, it's a patented technology. So that's the what. The how we do that is we take this patented technology where we can create these, these alginate microgels using a, a device and a method, which I won't go into, but it's, it's, a, it's a really neat, simple system. That means we can create these very small microgel particles at very large scale. They're all natural, all, in, all you know, al we use alginate, which comes from seaweed. Everything is a natural ingredient. And it just improves the stability of probiotics and improves the, the, the availability of bioavailability to humans. But why do we do this? What are the problems we're trying to solve? Is we know that a lot of functional foods and nutraceuticals don't work or, or they just taste disgusting, like omega-3s just taste disgusting. Um, you know, or, or they don't work because they're not stable. They die in product. We know a lot of probiotic products don't work. They're just not efficacious or they have a problem delivering it. Um, and so what we do is we create ingredients, functional food and nutraceutical ingredients, faster, smaller, cheaper, and better. We started with probiotics because we knew there was a big problem in probiotics. This is a, some data showing that in five different yoga products, all of the probiotics were dead within two to four weeks. And we knew we could solve that problem with our technology. We also knew that when you put probiotics into the gut of a human, they get killed by the acidic stomach. And we knew if you look at encapsulation at 1.2 or 1.5, we could keep them alive for an hour whereas probiotics uh, unencapsulated get killed within minutes. We also knew that some work done, this is University College London work, showed that, that the vast majority of probiotic products just don't work. And so we decided to focus on this particular category. Um, we tested our probiotics versus your cult, that little bar graph there is your cult at the end of shelf life, and basically all of the probiotics were dead by the end of shelf life, maybe 10 million, but you need a billion. And we knew that we could keep over a billion alive for four, four months. But what we tried to do is we tried to license that technology to all of the big dairy companies, all the big probiotic companies, and none of them were interested. And to cut a long story short, I finally tweaked when the guy at Ucult said, Cameron, we sell 30 million bottles of Ucult every day. I said, but the probiotics are all dead at the end of shelf life. And then he said to me, we sell 30 million bottles of Ucult every single day. Why am I going to give you 3% of my raw, of my sales in a royalty when we're not going to increase sales? Because that consumers are already buying it. They didn't have a problem that we could solve. And, and, and and so ultimately what we had to do is we had to find a different problem. And so what we did is we started talking to lots of consumers and we met Pippa. Pippa's a young 20 something female, health conscious, image conscious, war active wear all the time, um, really interested in healthcare and gut health, really interested in probiotics, but she was trying to reduce her dairy and she was trying to reduce her sugar. And there was no probiotic products back in early 2010s that actually had a, a no sugar or low sugar non-dairy. And so we knew everything there was to know about Pippa. We knew where she went, where she exercised, what her favorite pastime was, what website she was on, who her influences were, um, which is more likely to be renting. Um, you know, she's super active. And so then we developed a product for Pippa. Um, we initially started with, with Perky as a juice product and we had omega-3 probiotics. But what we realized when we started doing some, some, some concept testing, just without even creating a product, 
is that there was too much sugar in this product because it was 100% juice and it had, they just said to us, there's so many calories, it's like 300 calories and you know, 30 or 40 grams of sugar. And so that Pippa wasn't interested in a juice product. So then we created a product with Swiss where it was a probiotic, um, a water flavored drink. And we went a long way down the lines with Swiss, but then they got cold feet and they just thought this wasn't part of their, it, it wasn't tablety enough for them. And so then we took that product to market ourselves um, in this little bottle here, um, where basically we were focused on a, a basically a flavored water with about 15% apple juice, a little bit of stevia and you know, billions of live, live probiotics. Um, we launched that product, we did consumer testing um, at uh, Pando Cafe on Adelaide Street in Brisbane. And we basically took that bottle, uh, dropped it off in the loading zone and uh, gave them a whole of the boxes of that bottle and said, just sell it for whatever you can. And it became their number one selling drink within a month. We then launched it in a whole of IGA stores and it, the sales just kept going and going. And on the basis of that, we went out and raised $4 million into the company and spun it off. And that's sort of what the, um, what the packaging looks now. Um, and so, um, so we've been on this journey of taking this product. And then we've also, so my job is ProGel, so I don't have anything to do with Perky now on a day-to-day -day basis. We're just a license, they pay us royalties. We've then licensed the technology to Bigger by Nutrients who take lactoferrin, which is a dairy protein that boosts the immune system. Um, and we demonstrate that we can keep that alive. Um, we're now working on energy and caffeine and flavors with a whole lot of multinationals all around the world. So ultimately that's my, that's, that's where I learned a lot of my lessons and it's taken me a long time. I started that journey in 2006 and now we're 2022, it's a long time. Make sure when you start an innovation journey that you really care about the solution or you care about the problem because it's a long journey. So again, my question to you is what problem you're solving? Who cares? And how can you say it, solve it better than status quo? And the reason why I think this is really important is because the reason I love teaching, the only reason I teach, you know, because I make a lot more money outside of the university. The reason why I teach is because I believe this next generation, the millennials and the Gen Zs, really care about the world and are sick and tired of, of you know, the boomers and the Xs, as you keep calling us, screwing it all up. You guys are part of the solution. And so what I'm really passionate about is, is helping, and I know Jono's really passionate about this, is how do we help you guys actually become game changers and solve big problems that really need to be solved with unique solutions better than the status quo? Because the status quo at the moment is pretty crap. <laughs> and so what I'm really keen about is how do we help you guys actually do a better job of solving problems that some of us, and even some of you, are creating? Uh, and that's what I think is the job of an innovator. And that's all I got.